Good day, everyone. Welcome. I'd like to welcome our guest today, Amanda Lamond. I'm really happy to have Amanda here. I feel like we all could really learn a lot from her story. Um, and I feel this is going to be the part of maybe one or two different meetings with Amanda. And one of the things that um, I took away the most from our conversation today with Amanda is learning to look at our lives and look at things when this is not the plan. This is not the plan for us and things aren't moving forward in a way we want. So how do we look at that and reassess and pivot and take action in our lives? So thanks for joining us today, Amanda. It's good to see you all the way from beautiful South Africa. What part of South Africa are you in? I live in Cape Town, in a kind of rural part of Cape Town. So lots of horses, fields, that sort of thing. It's a beautiful part of the world, just beautiful landscapes, beautiful panorama, beautiful ocean out there. And it looks like you've got a beautiful background going on in your scenery back there. So Yeah, so this is my, my office which is a home office. Interestingly, when I designed it, um, with the help of a friend who's an architect, we decided it's going to be a temple because I really wanted my own temple at home. It's going to be a temple and an office and a kind of yoga studio. So we had that in mind. I love how when we when we first met, the thing that you know caught my attention about our conversation we had where you talk about, you know, your you know, how in tune you are with what's guiding you, how awake, you know, you strive to be where you are today and how it all connects and how you're so disciplined, how you're so committed to it. I definitely uh, didn't use the word disciplined with regard to myself. I can tell you that much. I know you say that, you say that, and I understand what you, what, what we think when we say that we're not disciplined, but it's amazing the amount of commitment it takes really to go from what you would say where you started, right? To where you are. These things don't happen without, I, I think your own true commitment to it, your action, or your response to whatever the, the the circumstances are, but really, I think given your path, like where you started all the way back, and I know it's sometimes hard to think about all the way back there because we look at those previous experiences and say they're all the way in the past. What do they matter today? But you know, if you can if you can take us back there when, and it's not like I would say the typical child. Would you say you were the the typical child wanting to grow up to be a professional, whatever? Is that how you how was life back when you were kind of thinking of the the future in the earlier days? So the biggest recollection I have, and I've been doing more childhood work because I, I understand now that, that the bulk of our trauma comes between the ages of naught and seven. And these patterns are then embedded in us and they come up for healing throughout our rest of our lives. We provoke these situations in order to bring the past into the present. So this work is continuous and there is no getting away from it because we will project these patterns into our businesses, into our relationships, into our homes. They will come into the present. So in the work that I've been doing recently, the, the biggest thing that comes out in my childhood is that I grew up in a family that weren't really able or skilled or equipped, as many aren't, to deal with my internal life and the emotional life. So in terms of the external that was amazing. There was fabulous support. My parents were at every, you know, school play, concert, whatever. I, I enjoyed acting. I realized quite soon on, you got a lot of attention and made everybody happy when you did well academically. So I was like, okay, these things, this gets me the recognition that, that I need. But I look back now and it was like a very external existence because I had no way of processing like what was going on inside me. I see now I was a child with huge feelings. Now that I have a kid with huge feelings, a lot of patterns similar to my own. I realized that that was quite difficult as a kid. Well, hold on, turn out, turn out, turn out. So here, here's the part that we're going to do differently today. Yeah. I'm not going to ask you to look back at that person, how you would see that person today. I'm actually not worried about what you think of that person. I just want to really go back to that person and I want to see through that person's lens back then. So I don't need the, I'm not looking for what it meant. I just want to know what a kid back then, call it, normal, abnormal, whatever, but that seven, 12, whatever year old, really, I'm interested in knowing what that person was, how that person was actually just seeing it at that level. And I think that's really what's most helpful to, to the viewers, because that's where many people just are in whatever phase they're in, is that they're still that person. So as that, say that child or that person growing up back then, who wasn't grown up to who this amazing person is today, not sort of looking back from this perspective, but going back to that perspective. What were, what were you looking at back then? What did it look like to that person? Yeah, what were the aspirations back then? 
<laughs> it's difficult. It it's me. difficult to take the mind back. Yeah, it is. You know, like sure. when I look back now, I still see it from like this perspective, looking back, my adult self. So I do remember feeling like quite overwhelmed a lot of the time internally, but also learning that what I loved was connection with people that really drove me. And so drama was one of the things where I felt I could really connect with people. I was sometimes the class clown because I like enjoyed that role. I guess it was this thing of learning how could I take what was inside me and then see that reflected in, in others. That's what gave me the greatest joy was looking for that sense of connection between the interior world and the external world. And I found that in the reactions of people. So sense of humor or curiosity or people saying, tell me more about that. That's, that's what I think motivated me. Wow. I know that's not easy to do. I remember when I was looking back at, at the seven-year-old, I remember one of my first thoughts were when I was a kid, for example, I would say, you know, someone asked me, what do you want to do when you grow up? That was a common question. And I remember vividly till today, the first thing I said I wanted to be was a taxi driver. And I was like, yeah, I want to be a taxi driver when I grow up. And I, you know what the thing is, Amanda, I don't know about if this happened to you or not, but I never realized people's, you know, like today, if somebody says, hey, I want to be a taxi driver when I grow up, the adult looks at that child and goes, oh, that's so cute. Uh, really? You don't want to be a taxi driver when you grow up? Like, you know, all of those thoughts that the adults were having. I never noticed that. Call it naivety, right? So I was this naive kid, and the thing that I wanted to be was a taxi driver. Like if you asked me, what do I, now I can tell you why I wanted to be that taxi driver. But back then, I remember I just wanted to be a taxi driver. And I loved just being in a car. I loved being around people, just like what you just said. And it, was, it brought me joy to see people go from one place to another. And so today I would say I'm a taxi driver of sorts. Right. But it all started back then because what I really said was I wanted to be a taxi driver. Forget about what it meant. But that's what I said. And and people around me were always I, I still remember this. Did you have this feeling? Because you said you were the, 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 the clown. I remember being treated like a clown, like people would be like or not not a, being being treated like a clown, but people going, oh, that's cute. Like, that's so nice. Do you remember those kind of responses from call it the adult world or the people around us at the time? Because when you're the clown, people are laughing and so on. You're, you're kind of getting that response that you want from people originally. But were there other also other sort of reactions that you were getting from people that you looked at and said, whether you liked or didn't like, but that were a little bit noticeable to you? Well, if I turn, because the earlier years are really hard to kind of... If I turn to a little bit later, so moving more into high school, I, I think it probably started obviously earlier than that, but I had the strong sense of, of justice, that, that fairness is really important. And so I would look at situations and it would just occur to me that this could be done differently. So there was a sense of how people were treated, that people matter and systems matter. But of course, this is young. I couldn't articulate any of that, but um, I would want to change things. And so I became an advocate for change at a really young age, like just standing up and going, no, like that is not the way we should be doing this thing. It needs to be done another way. Give me a specific example with that you say no to back then that you recall that was like something really bothered you back then. Okay. So I went to an all girls school and we had this uniform that hasn't changed design since 1922 when they designed it. So it's like got a neckline up to here and your, your <laughs> skirt dress had to kind of be on the knee. We had this really peculiar headmistress who ha had an, it was interesting. She had an eating disorder, clearly was, you know, kind of rake then. But interestingly, at the time, the school school was going through an epidemic of eating disorders. And it was so bad. They made rules like you weren't allowed to go to the bathroom. You were only allowed a lunch break. You weren't allowed out like when it was class time. Like it, it got pretty, it got pretty hectic. But our fairly dysfunctional headmistress, I remember her standing up and saying, the, the normal thing, like your skirts have got too short. Anyone who's been to a girl's school, they know this. Like they have to keep telling them, okay, girls, like you, so your hems have to come down a little bit. You're showing too much leg. And our headmistress stood up and she said, you know, like we are going to measure that your hems are in the right, you know, place. And she said, if you only knew what your fat teenage, what your chubby teenage legs looked like, you wouldn't have them that short. And I sat there thinking, like, we are in a school that is being known and publicly written about for having so many eating disorders. Like, are you out of your mind? 
So that was a sort of situation. I mean, that was a big one. But those moments when I'm just like, this is not, this is not okay. And I think one of the most difficult things, if I look back now, it's coming to me, it was people in authority who were wielding that power. And that's triggered something in me. Like when you have the power, you need to use it in the right way. And that probably occurred to me at like five, six. But of course, at that stage, it's just like, there's no way of making sense of any of that stuff. But it's, it's as you mentioned it, now I'm well, seeing this as trend of like, if you are given power, you use it wisely. So the headmistress says this, yeah. you say no, what, what, that's it? And then I it stops and she says, okay, well, I guess I'm not going to say that anymore. It wasn't like, a situation where I could stand up. Like that. Exactly. So I wrote her a letter and I got everyone in the class to sign it. You didn't just say, <laughs> you wrote her a letter? Wait. I love that. I I wrote to her and I got everybody else or whoever was interested in the class to to sign it. And I explained why her her behavior was inappropriate in the circumstances and why a public apology was needed, not just a private one. Oh, that's amazing. What do you mean you can't remember? So you send a letter and you don't remember what happened after that. Like, no, I've like telling me a headmistress is just going to let some kid off the hook like that. So. One of my the themes has been to rebel in plain sight. So when I got to, you know, my final year of high school, I was a prefect and I was head of house, which, you know, we have these houses. I don't know if they've got those in other countries. But anyway, it's like the team at the school. So I was I was a prefect and a senior prefect and I but pretty much. But at the same time, I was carrying out a huge rebellion. I was dating an older guy. I was taking huge amounts of drugs and going to rave parties on weekends because School was no longer doing it for me. The confines of this all-girls school with your hair like this, your school dress like this, you know. I was like, I'm done. But I understand this is what is required. There is this role I'm supposed to play. And that comes into, the, like, my one, one of my choices was to be an actress, to be an actress or a lawyer. I think those were kind of there. They were never clear, but it was like those would be interesting careers. But then I suppose I learned to act in a fairly dysfunctional way, realizing that the world is requiring one thing of me, and that's not really who I want to be, but I'll play it if it buys me the space to then, in my own time, do what I want to do. So I led a double life. And I think that was challenging for the headmistress because she had inklings that I had this double life. She couldn't fault me in what she saw. You know, I was voted into the prefect position and my marks are really good and I got a scholarship, but she knew <laughs> that she had this rebel on her hands. And I think that was hard to deal with. When, when you were deciding to write this letter, I mean, it's not a common thing for kids in high school to simply say, hey, you know, I'm just going to write a letter, get a petition signed and get this done. Where did you, where did you figure that that was going to make you successful? Where did, like, it, did you, did you, were you always successful the first time you decided to stand up to authority or did you figure out through, a, through experiences that, hey, this works and this doesn't work? Did, can you think about one where, you know, maybe earlier on, where you decided, hey, I'm going to stand up for something, and I got trampled, I got shut down, and it could be, you know, uh, you know, it could be earlier on in high school, it could be before high school. When might you say that you first started looking back on it and realizing, yeah, I feel, I feel like I want to stand up for something, but your strength wasn't fully developed yet, or you weren't yet as good at it. I wasn't that strategic around it. It was more. This is where the intuition comes in. It was more like this is wrong. Something needs to be done and I'm going to do it, regardless to me. So it wasn't a very strategic thing around like, well, how should I go about this? What would work? You know, what might it cost me? Da, 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 da. It, it was more like an instinctive, this is not okay. And I guess that has got me into trouble sure. on occasion. But I'm trying to think earlier back and nothing clear is coming to mind. Well, okay. So then, interestingly, you talked about, and, and I relate a lot to what you're saying, really, in terms of like whatever it's going to cost you. And you say it, it you know, sometimes it got you into trouble. I think that's an important thing for many people to understand. What were these costs or what kind of trouble was it, was standing up for justice getting you into? Because it plays into your story, I think, quite a bit. And it's where you draw your strength from. But it's your awareness that, hey, this is the cost or this is what trouble is considered. Can you talk a little bit about the costs at, at that time, earlier on, or the trouble that you would say it got you into? Well, definitely those final years of high school were pretty challenging because from the time I was about 16, I was checked out emotionally. I was like, I'm done. I don't want to be here anymore. 
And interestingly, I had a French teacher. She was also a music teacher, an English teacher and French teacher. And she arranged for me to go and au pair with a family in Switzerland for a term. But a week, a week before I was due to do this trip, I got mononucleosis, monoatlantin fever with a complication of hepatitis, and I was hospitalized and I couldn't go. And it was such an example now of like, you know, divine intervention. I even got it then, like on some completely disappointed. I was not meant to go. And I'll just, as an aside, share with you that my French teacher knew how disappointed I was and the hospital I was in was quite near my high school. And she brought my entire French class to the hospital parking lot. And we used to sing songs in French on a Friday and the whole class sang to me. Wow. And so I stood there with my drip, you know, at the window, barely able to stand. It makes me choke up even thinking about it. And in that moment, I felt such love. And that was also a transformative experience, realizing like how to demonstrate love. Like this was a really you know, unusual way. And then everybody in the hospital started sending notes to my room saying, were you the girl they were singing to and why? And thank you because it was so beautiful. Again, I can only answer it with the perspective I have now because I did not have that then. But I know that they were reaching out and it has just it has something to do with the energy that I put out, that I was able to get that sort of response back because everything's a mirror. It's funny you see French teacher. I had a, this is crazy, Trina. I also had around the same time in high school, there's always this teacher. There's always somebody like that. And you talk about a French music teacher, somebody who really gets that side of who we are. And I got to say, don't you feel like sometimes those are like, not that you would need validation because you believe in yourself, but it definitely gave you self. Oh, at 16, of course I needed validation. Sure? I needed validation in topics. I was just so, one bundle of like self-hatred and neuroses at that stage. I think that is what 16 is like for a lot of people. So I didn't go to Switzerland, but that obviously wasn't meant to be. Instead, a couple of, I think it was later that year, I remember one Sunday, my parents had friends over for lunch and I was stropping about something and I refused to come downstairs. And they were like, well, these are our friends. They've just moved here from Johannesburg and you are going to come to the lunch table even if you just eat and go back to your room. So I was like, fine. you know. So I remember clomping down the stairs with us and lunch at our house and promptly falling madly in love with the son of my parents' friends who just moved to Cape Town, who was older than me and going to rave parties and, you know, taking a whole of drugs, et cetera. So I think it was much to their dismay that they forced me to come to this lunch party because I ended up dating their friend's son. And, you know, I look back now and I, I was just waiting for something, you know, because my life wasn't working out how I wanted to. And I was, you know, like jumping at like banging on the door, like trying to get out. And, and this provided like a way, a way out. And I know it's some stage later because I talk openly about the fact that I'm a recovering addict. I got clean at the age of 24 and I don't call myself a recovering addict anymore. I have a lot of thoughts about that, particularly now that I know the power of the I am statements to walk into a meeting and say every single day I am an addict. I wouldn't do that ever again. So I'm very happy did that, been there, whatever, but I definitely wouldn't go there again. Anyway, so this, this guy at some stage felt some sense of responsibility, like when I turned out later to have a drug problem. But I look at it now, like I was just an accident waiting to happen. <laughs> it, it wasn't him at all, you know, and if it wasn't him, it would have been somebody else. But I basically found this sort of other outlet of rebelling at that, at that stage. And I look back now, like I'm not sure what my parents could have done differently because you know, at 16, like I said, I just want to finish high school. Send me to one of those cram colleges or whatever where you do the final, you know, two years in one. And they were like, I can understand from their perspective. They were like, but that's unthinkable. You got a scholarship to high school. You're this like straight A student. Like, what the hell? Like, no, you're going to finish high school. So I don't know. It's kind of like that's what that's what had to happen. So when you say, I, uh, when I heard you speak about your experience with navigating addiction that you knew that that would come out for you no matter what, regardless if it was that bad influence boyfriend or quote unquote, or a different pathway. So what, what was it that was happening inside of yourself? Do you feel that like that, that would have kind of like that? It's kind of like a relationship of being self-destructive, but also self-soothing, right? It's, it's, it comes out of soothing at a lot of our addictions. So like, how, why do you think that would have come out otherwise for you? So the way that we tend to live, we, we have been schooled and programmed and brainwashed to live from the outside in. 
and not from the inside out, but creation happens from the inside out. And so Mm -hmm. here you are trying to navigate your life. And I obviously, I had all these feelings because I'm a person of very big feelings. I mean, we all are, but I guess some people are more emotionally sensitive and, you know, volatile than others. That's just like it. We we come here with a package. And yeah, and the whole time I was growing up, I had these parents who were like, I can't really deal with what's going on inside. Like that was made clear. Like just shine on the outside and everything will be better as morning. And, you know, like we, I can't deal with the messy, the explosions, the, you know, the grief, the whatever that we can't really process. And so when I tried alcohol for the first time, like 13, 14, I was like, oh, wow, that really turns off those voices, you know, that are telling me I'm not good enough. And so that was the self-soothing. It was like, oh, my God, and especially at that age where you start like dating and boys and all of that stuff. So there's all that anxiety. And I was like, okay, this really drowns, drowns those voices out. And like, I can just like hang and have a good time. So there was such a relief in that. And then as I, you know, went on and, uh, you know, smoked weed and whatever, and then I discovered ecstasy oil and then cocaine and that became, cocaine became my drug of choice because I was like, oh my God, this is how I've been trying to feel my entire life. So for me, I described it as the equivalent of, you know, snorting self-esteem. It doesn't have this effect on everybody, but it does in quite a lot of people. So we know there's a huge amount of arrogance and ego, you know, at the most, but the girls mean a lot of people. Yeah. yeah. And some people just get a bit of a buzz and some people are like, it did nothing for me. And I'm like, you didn't try hard enough. <laughs> so for me, it, it was like a specific with my chemistry and my makeup. Like what it did was it, instead of drowning out those voices that said you're not good enough, it turned on new ones that said you're fucking amazing. And I was just like, oh my God, this is, this is clearly what I've wanted to feel. This like, here's the answer. I don't know. Well, obviously I know now <laughs> it's incredibly yeah. self-destructive, but it felt like this this way of regulating living in a in a world where you're supposed to be all of these things but you're not feeling them it felt like a way that i could like control that and finally feel how i thought i was supposed to be feeling yeah so it's like a very thing i've never done cocaine but just the way you're describing it right now i mean that could be a commercial for it okay this could like really it it, it is from what i hear it's a state that i often seek but I get it out of cheesecake. I don't get it out of, I haven't gone all the way to like something as strong as, as cocaine, but I think we all do it. We find a way when there isn't, when we need soothing and there isn't enough around, what do you expect a person's going to do? You got to get, we need the soothing. We need the soothing for whatever the reasons are, but you needed it and you found it. But what's amazing about you, Amanda, is that you go from there to calling it destructive. At some point in time, you start thinking to yourself, this is not it, what's next? And so when you got to that point and you you talk about it being addictive, soothing behaviors, finding our comfort zones are addictive. To break then, to then be uncomfortable in order to grow now becomes the next obstacle. And you, you hit that at some point in time and you started becoming aware of that. So... You know, what were the, what was the thought then at, at, at that point in time? So if we can go forward now, I, I thank you so much for sharing it the way that you did. You're, you're, you're soothing, but now you're starting to also use words like, you know, it's destructive. And you always have this, you're obviously, you're brilliant. You're able to see it. Everyone around is doing it at these parties. At what point in time and what were your thoughts then to start to say to yourself, no, this is not it. It got really messy. <laughs> really messy it, more extended black blackouts like that and something yeah at you. and i think again it was like i was holding on to two lives and that had begun in my probably final year or so of high school where on the outside i'm doing one thing and on the inside in my private life i'm doing something else and so that got more and more marked from the age of like 16 to, to 24. so i was at university i did really well i took three majors I was on the Dean's Merit List for Academic Performance, but at the same time, I was like bottoming out in terms of the drug addiction. But I knew that if I could play it on the surface, I could keep everybody convinced. And then the, the wheels kind of came off, I would say it was around 2000. So 2000, 2002 was, was hell when you know you can't keep doing it anymore. And yet you actually can't stop. That's the worst. People talk about, um, you got one foot, you know, in the past, like you want to keep doing it. And one foot is in a future that you know you need to do, but all you're doing is pissing on the present. It's what they, they say this in Narcotics Anonymous. Can you help me understand that a little bit better? Because that's, I think, to me where the, the secret is right there. 
you, you, you know, you're, you're solving for something at that point. How do you even tell you're bottoming out and how do you know that you can't go forward? Like usually if there's no thought, you just keep on going. And then most people, most people, many people end up just, you know, destroying, right? You make it out of that. That's what I'm trying to understand is that you're able to, first of all, you, you're, there's an awareness that's already there present in you that you're leading two different lives. You're, you're aware of this. Even when we're doing it, we're aware of it. You're aware of it. Many people don't even pay attention to that reality <laughs> that there's two but different. But any addict knows when you start lying about your use, you no. So while you were going through your your undergrad, yeah. I guess you would call it, is that it? And you're, you're still like leading this double life and then you start bottoming out. When you talked about bottoming them out, one of the things you said was you'd have blackouts. And that was like, that's it? That's all you noticed is, okay, so that's not working well? Oh, no. I mean, there's, there's I could write a book of this. Like, like, it wasn't just a couple of blackouts. I mean, it was full on co cocaine and, yeah. What I'm trying to understand is you said earlier that when you would do what you would do, and I relate to this quite a bit, is that you would do it regardless of the cost of the trouble because you believed in what you were doing. So if the soothing was that important, the soothing came at a cost. When is the cost too high now? So the self-hatred levels rose to a level where I was like, I cannot live like this. I know I'm destroying myself. And I think the most important thing, look, whoever's listening to this, they're, if they don't have some addiction in their own, you know, in their own lives, they're going to have a family member who does or a close friend. That's just it. Like they say that about 10% of the population is in addiction or substance dependency. But at the moment, we've ramped up in terms of where the world is to about 20%. Like that's one in five. It is that high. I'd say it's 95%, Amanda. And what I mean by that is addiction to comfort yes. is the point. It doesn't matter. It's not just substances. You're right. You're addicted to. Yeah. It's amazing how many times. Yeah, you're a coach today. You're helping people break out of comfort zones that they're addicted to. Work. Right? It's a huge uh, one. I mean, we don't People just that. overworking. They're like permanently glued right. to something so, because there's some affirmation yeah. coming out of here, which, it, and you don't have to be present. So, yeah, sex, shopping, porn, whatever. It's so we're addicted. Yeah. So, yeah. I get the stats. We're, okay, so this, this, this is what's important. In the addiction. This is what's important is that they talk about in addiction circles, like the invisible line. And that's the thing. It is an invisible line because you don't know when you've crossed it. And psychologically, it is almost impossible to get your psyche around the fact that you've crossed this line and you are now no longer able to stop because that's terrifying that you're not in control of your own organism anymore, like that it's acting like an automaton. It's doing stuff like without you because you're going, wait, hold on. Like, I, I don't want to do this. This is destructive. I've cheated on all my boyfriends. It, like my life's going to shit. Like I don't want to do this anymore. And then you do it again. And you're like, how? Like, how did that happen? And that's an invisible line. And to accept that you are over it is psychologically where most people can't get to. So you've got all these people going into treatment or seeing a therapist who says like, you've crossed this line. And they're like, no, I wasn't trying hard enough because that's the reality you have to create for yourself because oh. that's the only way it still makes sense. You're like, I was trying to stop, but I didn't try hard enough. You know, like, that's the only way I can understand it because otherwise to accept I've lost all control is too it. hard. That's beautiful and simple the way you just describe it. And I love it when you make it simple. You say you just weren't trying hard enough. So you say to yourself, Amanda, you got to try harder. What do you then say to yourself as far as whether it's opportunity, cost, reward? How did you motivate yourself to try harder? What did you do? Did I started going to NA meetings and I'd collect that chip and say that I got 30 days clean and then I'd go on a bender. I can't say that that was a very successful strategy. It's a start. It was a start. It was like, I'm going to do this. Okay, I've got to 30 days. Okay, if I got, I'm just going to like have one last party and then I'll start again. But it kept me going to meetings and meeting other people who had got clean. Yes. And I remember my frustration when someone said to me with the one day, like, I don't think that you're ready for this yet. You know, you haven't made, I was, it's, it's so funny now. I was outraged. Like, what do you mean? You don't think I'm ready for this? How dare you tell me? Yeah. yeah. But, but I think the best advice I got was someone That's saying, so, Look, you have to give it a good. year. You will not know if you want your new life and suddenly you've given it a year. And then, then you can look back and you can make a decision. You can go, okay, I've tried this other way. 
and and I you can you can actually weigh it up. But they said until you've given it a year, you actually aren't able to make that decision. So I was like, okay, okay, maybe I could give it a year and then figure it out. The interesting thing is that the equation was very clear in my mind at that stage. My framework for living is that life's hard. You have to work and all of these things you don't want to do. And the reward for that is these drugs where you get to feel how you have always wanted to feel. And so it became, in my mind, it was such a clear payoff. There's this shitty hard stuff you have to do in life, and this is the reward. And so when yeah. I was told you have to stop the drugs, I was like, no, but that makes no sense. So then I just left with the shitty part. Because that was my equation. I'm not saying it makes sense, but that was how I saw life yeah. and how many people do. Like, it's oh, hard. You pay the taxes. You, like, fight with your spouse. You raise the kids. You do all of the stuff. And then the reward is you get to blank out from all of that hardness with, like, whatever thing you've chosen to numb yourself. You're breaking it down. Like, it's making a lot of sense to me the way you're saying it is that you start changing your expectations. You know, before you wanted the, the payoff immediately and somebody tells you it's going to take a year. You know, Trina, we hear about, and I'm sure, Amanda, you've heard, you know, when you talk about changing habits, even you today as a coach, you think six-week timelines. I've heard six-week timelines. I've heard three-month timelines. You were given a year. And then you somehow in your mind had to say, okay, so it's going to have to be a year. So you start developing this. You change the expectation from this immediate response, this immediate return, this immediate payoff to a payoff that's worth waiting for. And at some point in time and during that year, you start re you start seeing the payoff. What were the payoffs that you started noticing first when you started going this way? The way I felt about myself. I was proud of myself Amazing. for the first time. I could look at myself in the mirror and that anxiety of just being started to lessen. I was like, I can, I can do this. And the more people I met who were doing it and who had lives and like friends, because at 24, I was convinced if you stop drinking, I was like, okay, the drugs. Okay, fine. Okay. Not everybody takes drugs. But I was like, alcohol, that is like, that's a deal breaker. I'm sorry. That one's not going like you cannot stop drinking at 24. Are you insane? And I remember saying like, but what about my wedding? Like you have to drink champagne at your wedding. And I remember my one therapist or coach, this counselor saying to me, are you engaged? I'm like, no. She's like, so are you planning your wedding? I'm like, no. And she's like, so maybe we can shelf that concern for now. I thought I was like, oh, okay. I mean, and as it turned out, I got married when I was 38 and like drinking was the furthest thing from my mind at my wedding because I say to people, it's like being a vegetarian. If 20 years later, you're still going, oh my God, and salivating over the meat, you should be eating the fucking meat. You know, you cannot stay in that state, but you know, vegetarians are okay. Like they're, they're like, I've made this choice. I'm not going to look around the room and be freaking out maybe the first week. Um, and interestingly, I am trying to be a vegetarian at the moment. So, so that's, that issue is alive for me, but yeah, it was a non-issue at my wedding, but it's amazing how we just project all of this stuff. But I think the hardest thing was when I thought the substances, the removal of these substances from my life, all of it, particularly the alcohol for the soothing. So the cocaine is doing something else. That's like turning me on into this like version of myself I want to be, the super powerful, like I'm cool, you know, got it all. And interestingly, I do enter that state now and I have realized that it's about it is about being fully on fire and sometimes when I'm channeling and I'm receiving all of this information and I'm holding multiple trains of thought because I would do that with cocaine, like I'm having three conversations at once. So there are times now when I'm channeling when I can feel the different streams coming in and I'm like parking that while I present this and I know that the people I'm talking to, I can see their eyes start to well up and I'm reaching them and that's the part of being on fire that I've always wanted naturally and I've experienced in other lifetimes. And then here you get to this earth plane and it's all so heavy and hard and you're supposed to be pretending you're somebody else. And all I was trying to do was get back to this place where like I'm on fire because that's what I know. That's the version of me that I've always wanted to be. Again, you know, it's amazing. You talk about like the projections that we make sometimes of ourselves when we're in a certain state and these projections are, are like nothing to do with the realities of it all. You, you started surrounding yourself, you started changing who you were surrounding yourself or at least onboarding some other people to support you. And that's a common denominator trainer. I hear that all the time. You realize you then start seeing the payoffs. And I think that that's such a beautiful payoff to, to acknowledge that you can look at yourself differently. And that's actually a huge reward uh, to be able to 
to love yourself again. And that becomes the root from which the other, you know, drivers and the other motivators come from. So now you're gaining this momentum just in time for you to then get ready to go to a very difficult stage of applying to law school because that comes. So wait, we missed it. We missed a gap in the history um, because you get I the- bottomed out. I bottomed out during law school. Yeah. Yeah. The first year of law school was my first year back from the UK, taking massive amounts of drugs. Still, Dean's Merit List, uh, able to hold it together. Dean's Merit List for academic performance and managing to like hold this picture together. And then I remember December, December of that year, you know, the end of our, our academic year. And my parents were like, I don't know what's going on with you, but like this is, I was going out all night, you know, you need, and I thought they were going to say rehab the, the next morning after I was really broken. And, and they're looking at me and they're yelling at me and they're like, you need... And I was waiting for like rehab and they said a job. So I got a job in the film industry over the summer, driving film crews around because I speak French and Italian and they film a lot of commercials in Cape Town. But anyway, through various circumstances, I meet this guy, I remember a producer going to New York to stay with him for two weeks. And it was in New York. I remember I just was having panic attacks like on the street. I was like in free fall. I mean, it was a thing of being out of the country. My system was wrecked. And I got back home. I think I was asking the pilot for oxygen on the way home. Like that was not a good flight. Get back home. And I tell my parents, I have a drug problem. Very small. <laughs> you know, just, I tried some drugs a handful of times, you know, like I'm totally downplaying it. But basically what followed then was, so my second year of law school was really hard and I was in and out of treatment. And then I, I went to rehab many, many times. And I think it was only at the end year that I, I finally got it. I was like, I was done. I had a very bad, it wasn't even a relapse because, you know, I told you I was only clean for about 30 days at a time. I was in a treatment center and I got kicked out and I went on a, on a bender of note and there was this point. And if it's useful to anybody, I mean, I'll share it, but I was, I'd been on a bender for two, two to three days. I was with this guy that I'd been in rehab with, and I'm incredibly grateful to him because I believe that he saved my life. And I'd been in a blacked out state, taking loads of drugs, driving around with drug dealers in the car. No recollection of this, like whatsoever. And finally, on the like Sunday night, I was so ill, just like vomiting, hadn't eaten. And there was this guy, this like random guy, you know, that I'd hooked up with in re- rehab. And I just like looked at this picture in this random hotel room, B&B. And I was like, this was not the plan I had for my life. There was this moment on my knees, done, done changing track and I guess I was desperate enough in that moment and that's why the fascinating thing people say all the time I get asked this how do you know when you've reached rock bottom and the only answer is it's when you stop digging because the fact is there's always further to go there is always further to go Mm -hmm. and I could have gone further like I never got to where other people got to. I've met people in rehab who were selling their bodies on a regular basis, like stuff that I never got to. But for the grace of God, go I. So rock bottom is when you stop digging. And in that moment on my knees, I was like, I'm done. I'm just done. This, mm-hmm. this, is, this is enough. It wasn't easy from that point, you know. I had to literally like crawl back home and ask for forgiveness and pick up again, like pick up the pieces of my life. I got a lot of help along the way and of course i started looking sorry to see like in yeah hearing you speak part of that that comes up for me too is there's a choice right there's always a choice when you come in that is do you do you choose the pain of staying put or do you choose the pain of growth yes because there's going to be pain either way yes and it's it's choosing when you when you decide to stop digging through that rock bottom it's it's which pain are you going to choose? And I just did it trying yeah, to stay to yeah. Like I said, it had been really hard at that point. You know, like I'd not go out with the friends. It's really different. different. I was trying all of these yeah. things and like they call it white knuckling it. Like when you want to use and you're just like, I'm going to just sit on my hands or watch a movie or whatever I can, like, because I'm not going out tonight. So that was really hard. And it's only when the point got, when I was like, but this, this is worse. Like I know that getting key was hard, but the situation, yeah. it's worse. I'm making the choice now. It, that's beautiful. And right there, you know, you make, you make the decision, but you, you know, it's some, it's funny what saves us sometimes. And I'm just listening to you say this for the first time, but the words that stand out to me were that you said, this was not the plan. So it's amazing. You had a plan from somewhere before you had some idea, some vision, 
of where you wanted to go from the beginning. It was always with you. And in spite of all of the, you know, the darkness or where we go or what we do, that plan, because you had it somewhere, stayed with you. Whether it was, I want to be an actor or a lawyer or whatever you said to yourself yeah. once upon a time way back, stuck throughout all of that. It was so strong. And you had a plan. It's funny. A lot of people talk about, why is it important to have a plan? Well, here's one good reason. Because one fine day when we're at a, at the bottom somewhere, it'll come back to us and we'll say... And sometimes all you know is that that isn't it. Sometimes you, you don't that. know what it is. You just know that you that's so. not it. Because knowing what you don't want can yeah. be very powerful. Yeah. It's actually incredibly yes. powerful. A hundred percent. A hundred percent. I love how you said it both ways, that even if you don't have a plan, you can look at where you are and you can say, that's not it. And, and whatever my plan is, this is not going to get me there. Like, I'm not a genius, but like whatever the plan may be for my life, this, this is, not, is not on the road. <laughs> that was clear. No, being in a very... Yeah, yeah. I, I think that's the important thing to notice and understand about it. It doesn't have to be whether... It's, it's not the story about drugs or it's not the story... It's about everything. Everything yeah. works the same way. You know, it could be a, it could be a career... It could be a relationship. It could be so many things. It's a way. And then we get to this point. And you also said, I love how you said it. I'm just going to stop digging here. Doesn't mean like digging requires effort. You're going to go dig somewhere else where you're like, I'm done digging here now. That's it. I love how you said it. So, so thank you for really simplifying it that way and, and filling in that gap. So if it's okay with you. So it's beautiful. You, you decide there and then. And it's so vivid to you till today, you can recall it. You say, I'm going to stop digging. Then you go back to the plan you're proceeding with now. I guess now you're in your second year of, of law school and you finish it off. It was the end of the year. It was like no November, December. We still had our finals. And I was repeating this exam because of I screwed it up the year before. And so after this like massive relapse thing, they wouldn't let me back into what is called secondary care. So you get primary care, which is the rehab that you go to first. And then you go to a house where you can still go to university or, or you can work, you know, but you're staying in a house with other addicts. So that's generally referred to, they have them all over the world, as secondary care. So the secondary care place I'd been in said, you can't come back till you've been in primary. So after this thing, I went back into, into rehab for like five days and while I was there, they have all these programs and, you know, circles and things you're supposed to do. And I was like, no, fuck it, I'm done with all of that. I said to my mother, bring my files. And I decided I would write my finals. And so I got my books and I just sat down in rehab and I crammed. And then I remember going to the exam and people were all stressing. And like, I was like, you have no idea what stress is. <laughs> like I was let out of rehab to write this exam. And they, they thought I was kidding. I was like, no, it really is that bad. And I wrote that exam and I, I do remember that on the board they wrote after they wrote drinks at this place that all the students go to afterwards. And like that's what took up a lot of wow. my energy during the exam. It was sitting there going, I'm never going to be able to do that again. Because at that stage that felt like a mountain. And these little acts, like nobody knows, you know what I mean? They were actually doing it as an inclusive thing. <laughs> like I think of all the kids who don't drink or the, you know, the Muslim kids, but whatever. Drinks at this place afterwards. And I was just like, oh my God, I'm trying to focus on the exam, not the fact I have a major drug and alcohol problem. But anyway, I'd made that decision. So I passed that exam. I passed the next one, you know, got into the next year. And there was a huge amount of shame and failure because now I dropped a year going from Dean's meritless blah, blah, blah. You know, like I, that was quite a big thing to handle, but that's kind of like how it had to be. And at the end of the next year, I finished my law degree. I got into a top firm and I celebrated one year teaming. And as one of my friends at Narcotics Anonymous said, Amanda had everybody except the press after one year. My parents came. I think my brother and sister came. My therapist came. <laughs> like everybody came. And it was, it was amazing to celebrate that with them. You deserve that celebration. I think sometimes the thing we don't do enough and I, I, I mean, you could probably speak to it as well, is that we don't celebrate enough along the way. And it doesn't have to be done, obviously, with alcohol and the other ways. 
at least just just recognizing ourselves and sharing that recognition with others who were all part of getting us there. You did it after a year and some, you know, you could have done it after a month, two months, six months, but it's amazing. You did it after a year. And, and, and that's, I think, another thing sometimes that people don't do enough that doesn't give them that, what do you want to call it, that recognition gives us? What, what do you call it, Trina? I need, what do you I'm call appreciate- it? It's effort. It's affirmation that you're on the right it? path. Acknowledgement. Yeah. Yeah, and nothing wrong with that. It's it's affirmation. Yes. Uh, but it's not necessarily external. Yeah, but it's I, your I, own. I, it's I, like I, affirming. I, I'm right. on the right path. This feels good. It doesn't have to be about other people. And you're right. Celebration. I think we should be celebrating all the time. I have business coaches now that are like, you celebrate the hell out of everything. You have one client by one ten dollar meditation that you created. You celebrate. You know, you celebrate everything. I celebrate with cake. I remember I went the other day to the reception and I said, "Hey, we gotta. Can you please order some cake?" She's like, "Well, why? Why are you ordering cake today?" And I was like, "Because it's Tuesday. Come on, let's go. It's almost three o'clock. Let's get it going." So that's amazing that we don't do it enough, especially when we've been through such hard. The other piece to it with the celebration is the importance of connection. And you can't you can't underestimate or undervalue those different people that were there to celebrate and witness what you accomplished, what that connection does for our capacity to get over whatever challenges in this one being addiction. It's incredibly important in the concept of addiction is having layers of connection of people that understand that. And I, I think that's something that you had those built in because some of it were, were your family and you sought out your therapist and so forth. You had that resourcefulness is, is other people sometimes don't have those connections or aren't able to foster those connections or don't know how to develop those connections to support them to be able to celebrate each other. And so it's just such an important piece. Like we just kind of like, we just like the celebration piece is really important because it has so many kind of ripples that come out of it. Yes. And of course, for other people. I, I mean, I remember always enjoying for the years that I went to and enjoying the milestone meetings, as they call them, because it just gives you so much hope. I mean, we even remember watching when Harry met Sally. To, uh, there's that beautiful scene where she gets, I think it's her one year clean. It's amazing and makes this amazing speech. And it's like we all need those moments. And so it's a gift to other people. And when sometimes people didn't want to share on their milestone, I remember, you know, the person needing the meeting saying, but you're doing it for everybody else. It's not just about you because we all need those stories. Yeah. You know, Amanda, what I love about your journey to this point and Trina, we're going to have to have a second episode. There's more. This was. We haven't even got on to being a lawyer yet. <laughs> in, in yeah. This much depth, actually. <laughs> I, I, I think that's a separate thing altogether. I think the. I think the the thing that I'm getting out of here that Amanda, I'd love to to start wrapping up with with you is you've always had this intensity. You've always had this energy. And it feels like there was something out there that you had to first experience where somebody asked, and you must have known from an earlier age, you're strong. You're strong. You're brilliant. When you focus on something, ain't there's nothing that's going to stand in your way when you go out there i mean you proved it when you're talking about your experiences in high school with the headmistress uh, and that you can handle juggling two different lifestyles or personalities like even that itself is a challenge that sometimes we i know i did this i kind of gloated secretly to myself that i could be two separate people in two separate occasions it's almost like uh it kind of helped and fed my ego that look at this i've got people fooled or i can be two different people I could be three different people, actually, depending upon the situation. In my cases, I had many different people that I could be at different times. So that that also feeds you, and it gives you your like your affirmation that you are strong. But then you got faced with something that was, in some ways, even stronger than you, and it 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 took you down, and it humbled you, and it, it fu- it's funny how people that are strong, people that are powerful aren't complete in their power without humility. And all of what happened was just for one reason, all just all together. I mean, at least from where I'm sitting, I know in my experiences, I did, I couldn't go on to that next level to go jump and get those other challenges 
without having a great dose, without having a great connection with my humility and staying humble with the strength. I feel like the stronger you are, the more humble you need to be. Otherwise, it just doesn't work. And all of these things kind of brought you to that realization. You talked about falling behind a year after being prefect, after being top of class, after being a leader. Can you speak to that humility that you got out of all of this? Well, I know in Narcotics Anonymous and Alcoholics Anonymous, they talk a lot about humility because it's arrogance that keeps us sick and keeps us from connecting with ourselves, I think, more than anything else. You're not being real. You're not connected with yourself when you're being arrogant. But then there's what they call right-sizing because you go from like arrogance, like I'm fine, I have problems, to like I'm so filled with shame, like I just want to die, like I've ruined my life, I've trashed all my relationships and use this. And so somewhere in the middle of that, you have to do this process of right-sizing. Of, of connecting with other people and going, I am like everybody else. I have great stuff about me and I have shit stuff about me. And it's like, I'm going to learn to embrace this whole messy parcel that I don't need to hide any parts of it. And I think that's the rest of the life journey. That's this integration of right sizing. I am no worse than and I am no better than anybody else. And I think what I learned through that journey is it's suddenly a piece just occurred to me now that, which may take us to another episode, but my understanding of how everything is within because now I'm here to, in terms of spiritual teaching and helping people in this time that we're in, it's understanding that everything is inside us. The cycles of creation come from the inside out. And in the same way, we still think like I was attacked or I was raped or I was assaulted. Somebody did something to me. The whole legal system is built on somebody did something to me and they must pay for it. And the radical break comes when we understand it's all inside us. And so my addiction gave me this chance to see nothing was being done to me. It was all inside me all along. And therefore, only I could free myself. Nobody else could do it. And that's kind of this bigger, this bigger sort of wave of the journey that I'm seeing now. It's like, there's only you. There's only you. There's only you. Could you finish with one last insight that you've talked about and you've spoken about it so well? You called it the invisible line. You know, when we cross it going one way and when people are going through an addiction with anything, or I don't want to even use the word addiction. I want to say when people are very comfortable in a certain state and they know they need to get out of that state of comfort. Okay. There is an invisible line going back the other way. And because that line is invisible and they can't see it sometimes, they don't make the effort to then move because it actually seems so far away that they don't, they give up on even trying to come, come out of that comfort or come out of that addiction. Now you, you've been through it. You've had, you figured out how to, you know, what to say to yourself. You've spoken to that, but what do you say to somebody who, who's struggling with that invisible line on the way back? and seizes as so far away. You figure this all out. By 26, you were back and you're going into the next phase. But sometimes people see there's such a long way to go that they don't even want to start. So you talk about going it's back, but you can't go back you once say? you're over the invisible line. That's the thing about this line. You don't get to go back. There is no returning to an Amanda whose body wasn't reacting to alcohol in that way. And so I've made the decision not to drink again, but there are people who have managed to drink again and done so what we say successfully. I just realized that in this game, the stakes are too high because I look at my life now and I'm like, wow, would I want to risk everything? My marriage, my kid, like I know how messy it gets. And the other thing is they talk about people who do the research for you. So, you know, I had a, a sponsor of mine and she started drinking again on her honeymoon several years later or on some holiday. She, I think she already had a kid. I'm not sure. But like it was messy and she ended up back in treatment, I heard from somebody else. And so we call that like she did the research for me. I didn't have to go and try that again. So for me, I made that decision. But but yeah, with certain things, with other things, I'm like, fine. But But I decided with alcohol, there's no going back. So I was just curious when you spoke about going back over the invisible line, I just wanted to clarify, there is no going, there's no going back because we're in this yeah. constant evolution. You may find that where you are now is you're not even the same person. I mean, they say every cell in our body is replaced every seven years. So we're not even the same person. We cling to this idea that this is who I am. 
And that's become my favorite subject. Like, who are we? You know, we just, we're these random bunch of beliefs that we consider, like, that's me. We're not this body. We're not this mind. But depending on how much you've changed, like, I, I would say that's a journey you cannot even fathom. They say just for today, because I could not consider that it was the rest of my life. The headlights only shine on the next stretch of road. You cannot, you cannot possibly try and think like, well, in 10 years time, maybe I can drink again or whatever it is. You can't go there. You've got to just deal with today. Maybe I didn't ask it right. I meant somebody who's stopped still there, not having made the progress, not wanting to come forward because they see, they don't see, they don't see the reward. They don't see the payoff yet. They don't understand it yet. They haven't experienced the motivator that you got after you started seeing that result that you could look at yourself again and like yourself again. They're still stuck there. That's the person who I'm wondering if you, you could have a message for to say, like, you know, as, you know, as far as it looks, because that's the trouble. Because it looks so far, it's not worth it. Do you know what I mean? What do you say to that? That makes me want to cry again. I never, ever want to feel the way I did about myself then. And I will do anything not to go back there. Because life is hard. There is so much to deal with. You know, there's so much joy and there's wonderful stuff. But like, it's hard. And when you are trying to navigate life from a place of self-hatred, it's impossible. Yeah. You're in that place now. All I can say to someone, it, it gets so much better. And you just have to believe and you have to use other people's faith until you develop your own. And that's what those communities and NA meetings are about. It's literally holding onto the faith of others when you have none of your own. And, so, and that's why we, you know, I saw the tagline on your thing. It's like we need each other. We cannot do this alone. There is none that journey alone. But each person, every time I went to a meeting and someone shared six months and like I saw their mom or their boyfriend or their husband or whatever it was, like cheering them on, I was like, okay, okay, okay. Like maybe I can, maybe I can, maybe I can. And that's all you need is a maybe. Maybe I can. And somehow the days, you know, add up. And I remember one day sometime in that first year, I bought myself flowers and I bought myself flowers and I, and I went home and I was like, I want to say sorry. Like, I really want yes. to say sorry. I've treated you so badly. And it was part of like making amends to myself. Of course, there are the amends to the other people that you have fucked around. But like the biggest one, and of course, where it all starts is like the, that making amends to yourself. And so that's, that's it. It's like you cannot live in self-hatred. And if you are there, you have this. And I'm proof. You're amazing proof. Thank you so much, Amanda. We're, we're going to do another episode with you on other stuff, but this was just so kind of you, <clears throat> so kind of you to really share, to take us back there and walk with us step by step through through that journey. I, I, I feel indebted to you for just, you know, articulating it so vividly. I could relate. I could understand. And you took us through the whole, through the whole experience. So thank you so much for for sharing that with us. That was just amazing. Thank you so much.